Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. I tell you, I cannot wait to have this guy on the show. This guy has been producing music, helping make music for literally decades for many, many stars, many music celebrities uh, that you've definitely heard of. And we've had a lot to talk about his career, what he's working on right now. Tony Mantor joins us here. Tony, welcome. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Yourself? Very well. Uh, and but I, yeah, I feel like I'm with an old friend because we've been doing stuff in the music world for a lot of years. You're making the music. I'm in radio. I've been playing the music. I probably played the songs you produce <laughs> along the way. <laughs> well, you know, what's really interesting is, is um, I, uh, I started out in radio myself. I was like, um, I don't know, 15, 16 years old. And there was a local radio station. It was, a, it was an AM at the time. Me too. And, and of course, at that time, they, uh, it, when, when it got about six o'clock, seven o'clock, they shut it down for, until the next morning. Me too. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, this station decided that they would help young guy, young guys that wanted to get into the into the business, and they went. They put their station on cable. So, so for like six to ten or six to eleven, I would be the DJ on 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 cable, and and then after that happened, I I made the transition into their bigger radio station, which was. Uh, up in Maine, and it was one of the largest radio uh, stations as far as circumference and in in the in New England. It was WTOS, and it's and it was and it's on the top of Sugarloaf Mountain, hundred thousand pure watts going out, and we cut we had the biggest signal in in pretty much New England. Wow, I can relate to pretty much all of us. You're you're telling my story. <laughs> it's like the same <laughs> thing. I was. Barely 17, didn't even have a driver's license, got a job, AM station. My mom would take me after school, do my thing. They would sign off. The time you sign off depends on the time of the year. In the winter, it's earlier when the sun right. sets. Yeah. And then just rinse and repeat. And then six months after that, I got a job at the big station on Long Island, which was the 12th largest market in the country at that time. And uh, you got kind of the same thing. So you, how did you transition from that in your career into producing music? Well, um, actually, what what happened is during my formative years between eight and 15, I was learning how to play the piano. Wow. Uh, and, and then uh, uh, that opportunity. So I was I was in the high school band and 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 I, I'm actually kind of made a deal with with the uh, band teacher at the time is because the band was percussion and, and you know, horns and all that. And I played piano. So, so he came to me, wanted me to join. I said, no, nah. I said, you know, I play piano. There's no place for piano in, in, in what you're doing. So they created a stage band for me. If I would, if I would take and do percussion in the marching band and the concert band and all that. So I did that. And then uh, the opportunity came along for me to do the radio thing. And because I loved music. So I didn't know what music had in store for me. So it was like, okay, if I don't, do anything in music past high school maybe i can do something in music with radio so so i started creating kind of a persona on on radio and and then i made it to mm -hmm. the tos and and did did a lot of goofy things on that because they back then they allowed you to do stupid things and and because people liked it you know so so i did that and and then uh, you know i had a chance to go to berkeley college of music in boston so i went there and and i used that in my performance uh, and I just kept growing as a performer. And then eventually I made the transition to Nashville with some friends of mine that uh, needed some needed a ride to get down there. And then from there, it just started, the dots started connecting. Wow. So you singer, performer, and then also a producer as well. You do both. You have done both. Yeah, I, I actually started, I mean, in my policy from... From like 18 years old to my mid 30s, I was trying to do like everybody else does in music. I was trying to get get my record deal, try and get on radio, get out there performing across the country to concerts and, yep. and just create my mark. Uh, I had some I had some, uh, you know, I had some hits, you know, I mean, they 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 were uh, they hit the uh, the cash box charts back then. And and I mean, I did OK. And I was working with some uh, with a couple of guys. Uh, matter of fact, Bob Millsap, he was uh, he he had produced a lot of a lot of major stars. But he he any, always, any like, connection to Ronnie Millsap? 
No, no, just uh, just oh, well. <laughs> just not have the same last name. But but him and Tom Collins were great friends, you know. So so you know because Tom produced Ronnie, you know. So so um, the interesting part about that is with all the people that he that he was associated with and what he did, he had he he always would say, hey, my claim to fame is that he published the song "You Needed Me" that Ann Murray recorded. And then, so he took an interest in me. And then uh, Gary Paxton and 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 Bob were were partners on a lot of things. And Gary was the lead singer of the Argyles with Alley Oop and a lot of those big hits. And so they kind of took me under their wings and and developed me as a singer. And then in 1990, late 92 was when Bob told me, he says, man, he goes, you've learned the music business. You've learned, you know what a hit song is. You, you, you know how we do things. We're getting ready to retire. Why don't you get off the road and come down here and do what we do? Get into wow. production development. So I had to really stop and think about the time. Did I want to do that? Because, because it's like, I was having some records that was hitting the charts. And, and back then uh, A&M records was interested in, in me. And ultimately I got, I lost that deal because, because of a, a, re, a slight recession of the time. And then later on, RCA showed some interest and, and it was like, I'm, I'm getting, do I want to make this transition because I'm getting some interest with these labels, but I decide, but the one thing that, that actually made me decide was I was in the studio with with uh, doing a production with Gary and one of the session players came up to him and said, man, I saw your son here yesterday. And he said, I didn't even realize my son was here. So he had because he was all over the all over the road doing shows and everything. He actually had a grown son that he didn't know. You know, and like I'm, literally didn't know or or he knew he had one, but he just didn't focus on him. No, he well, um, I mean, he was. He knew he had him and 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 he was he was uh he just wasn't a priority, I guess. I gotcha. I gotcha. You. you know, yep. so so because he was on the road and coming home all the time, he didn't get to see him growing up. He just to get he just got kind of saw him when he actually had grown up. Can you I know? just say cats in the cradle? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. You know, so so when I saw that, that kind of made me because I had two young sons at the time, and I'm <sighs> going, okay. I'm not going to have that happen to me. So that's kind of what caused me to say, you know, okay, let's take a move to Nashville. So I, I made the move in 93 and, and then they retired, got out of the business and, and I started forming my own little entourage and it kept growing. And and here I am today, you know? Wow. Yeah. What a career it's, uh, <clears throat> were you happy when you moved to Nashville initially? Uh, you know, when I first moved, I only knew a few people. And and that was tough, you know, because I I knew a few session players and and because Bob and and Gary I could call and talk with anytime I wanted to, but but it wasn't the same as having somebody they can go over and you know and sit down and or invite over to your house or whatever. So the first few years was was tough, you know, because because I was I was in a new place, I was, you know, doing trying to create my own my own brand, trying mm. to get my reputation going. And it was about the third year, I think, that things started falling in place. And then it started building from there. But actually, I started out Plateau Music as a production development company. I was just working with singers, producing them, pitching them to labels, uh, getting my contacts with the labels so they knew that I, I pitched quality projects, and working with the publishers. And it wasn't until 2005 that I actually turned Plateau Music into a record label, where I started actually putting putting using some of my contacts that I had at radio with the promoters and everything to work, creating my own label and, and putting people out there. How has the business changed now and looking back, let's say even 25 years? Oh, you know, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because I've had in the last couple of three weeks, I've done interviews on different podcasts and different different uh, you know TV shows and everything, and that question has come up every time. Hmm. You know, and like I just did a I, I just did an interview with with a uh, LA based program called Behind Behind the Music, uh, and and we covered that whole thing yesterday. And how it's changed is back in the early '90s, mid '90s, um, we had 26, 27 major labels here in Nashville. Today we have three, 
you know, you've got Sony, you got Universal, and you got Warner Brothers. You know, and now now you've got you've got some major independents like Curb and Broken Bow and you know those types. But but the the whole dynamic has changed because if you because when when I first moved when I first before I moved here when I first came down here with with my friends just to give them a ride to Nashville. I mean, I was into pop music and, and rock and roll because I mean, TOS was a rock station and and that's what was the kind of style that I did. So I really had a negative view of Nashville, even though I've never been there. You know, mm. so when I got here, I, I, I looked at him going, wow, this is just a concrete and steel like any other city. The only difference was it was more laid back and more friendly. You know, so so uh, when you walked Music Row back then, you'd walk from old house to old house and each old house would have a publishing company or a small record label or, you know, whatever, or a booking agent or whatever, management company. I mean, it was just totally different. You walk Music Row now and it's like, it's like, it's changed. Just, I mean, some of the, some of the iconic studios that's had Paul McCartney and people like that and have been torn down for condos. You know, so it's completely changed. And of course, the dynamic of the music has changed because you've got um, uh, back back in the in the 90s, if if you had a, a singer that sold 200, 250,000, 300,000 units, they were like king or queen. Today, if they sell 200 to 300,000 units, they're out the door tomorrow, you know, because. <laughs> Because it's just changed that the development has gone away. They're not they're not willing to lose money on a consistent basis to build a career like they used to. So I mean, the whole dynamic has changed. And then you get into the songwriting part of it. The uh, back in the eighties and nineties, I had some friends of mine that that got some just album cuts, you know. And and on the albums, you know, they weren't superstars, but they were fairly well known singers that would go out on the road and everything and i mean these songwriters made fifteen twenty thousand dollars a cut today that same scenario they might make 15 or 20 dollars because because your spotify and, and all in places like that have have got it down so they're only given fractions of penny for every pennies for every time it's streamed and so i call it basically renting a song because because when you pay your 9.99 per month for uh, Spotify, you can download all the songs. You're just downloading them, and then every time you play it, you pay a fraction of a penny. And then if you change your mind, you don't want that song, you just get rid of it and bring in another one. You've rented the song, and the songwriter's made nothing. Yeah, yeah, and you don't own it because even though you downloaded it on your device, you can't play it anywhere else except in 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 the Spotify player. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, hmm. so it's the whole dynamic of the music has changed, you know, and. And for a while there, it changed for the good because even with streaming and 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 the internet and everything, the independence was actually getting a foothold and, and being able to build. But whenever you're dealing with major labels, major corporations that have big bucks, they're eventually going to figure it out and they're going to hire the people that can take and stomp you back down the ground. And and basically, I, I mean, I hate to use those phrases, but but that's what they've done. They've gained control back so that the independent does not have the the oomph that they once had when, when it first started. So it's a, uh, it's a changed, changed marketplace. You've really got to know how to focus. You really got to know your marketing and you got to really know how to get it out there and use all these platforms so that they can benefit what you're doing. Wow. When we look at the different genres of music, you look at pop, look at R and B, call it rap, whatever. Uh, then look at today's country. Do you think that it's easier to make a mark or be successful in one genre over the other? My view, I look at country and I'm not, I'm not a hardcore country fan, but you know, sure. definitely appreciate it. I have a venue that I'm connected to with my radio job. Um, and it, it's mostly country artists that come in and it sure. just, you know, the music just is, feels so organic. Is it easier to break into that um, genre over others or it's all the same? Well, um it's really pretty much all the same wow. i mean because because um it's a money game i mean i mean if you're what people fail to realize is that when you decide that you're going to become a singer you're opening up your own independent business 
So it's just that mm. instead of selling instead of selling shoes or hats or clothes or or whatever the <laughs> item may be, you're selling music. You know, so so um, the 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 difference is is how much money do you have to market yourself? So like if you if you go into New York City and decide you're going to open up a, a you know a custom apparel shop, you can. What's what's the three play things that's the most important? Location, location, location. But in this particular case, location's not as much important as it is the um, advertising budget that you can use to present yourself so that you can promote yourself so that you so that the location becomes your local radio station wherever it may be. So if you don't have the deep pockets to take and go out there and, and really push yourself and 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 really market yourself properly, then it's a lost cause. You're going to just be able to do some local stuff and and build yourself into a, hopefully a regional market. And just this, with that said, there's still a lot of people out there that's making a living playing music because they play their, they do their little tours, they sell merchandise, you know, and nobody in the rest part of the rest of the country has heard of them. But if they do it properly, they use YouTube properly, they use Spotify and iTunes and all that, at least they can get themselves a market. And if you get yourself a thousand people that follow you and really like you, those thousand people may follow you wherever you go, buy your merchandise, buy your new album when you put it out, and you can still perform and make money because you have to take and look at it as a small independent business. But if you're trying to compete against the big boys, you know, you're going on on you know, on the major you know rock station, a country station in New York. And I mean, that takes a boatload of money because that's the monitored market. You know, and you in radio understand the difference between monitored and secondary, which is which isn't uh, regulated quite as 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 much as it is on the monitored. That's basically they set it up in a computer based situation. Well, let's let's say right now you're not going to get on a radio station. You're not even even a. Oh you know, somewhat secondary market to get your stuff heard. It just doesn't happen. It's yeah, I mean, and in my circles, you know, maybe it's different in Nashville. Um, but like the old days where somebody would walk in with a song, Hey, you got to play this. This is fantastic. Sometimes it happens. Or if there's a certain feature on a radio station where new music gets exposed, but more times than not, you know, and I've been a program director of radio stations. It's we're not playing it. It's, you know, how it's working is let me check with the consultant. Yeah, that's usually how it works. Exactly. And not only that, but but you've got, you know, like in in like when I mean iHeart before before they were iHeart, you know, media. Clear bit. channel, clear channel, right? Clear channel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, and and you had, I mean, it's like it's like I released a gospel single one time and and uh, I talked with a person on K Love, you know, and and they were on in their in their, you know, headquarters. And and they were proud. Okay, get this. They were actually proud that hey, if we played this song, it's getting played on every single K Love song at the same time. Yeah. Going, wow. I'm going, that is just so horrible. And 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 she says, What do you mean? I said, because you have left any, you have not left any opening for any creativity on the local level. I said, because just because somebody likes something in New York or LA doesn't mean they're gonna like it in Austin, Texas, you know, or or where the spot may be, you know, and and you've got to have some allow for some creativity. You've got to also allow for some new people to come in and build up. So if you don't get in with the right sorts of people, you've got no chance. And it's so true, Tony, the the regional aspect of it. You know, I'm in the New York area. Freestyle is huge or was yeah. huge. But, you know, if you're somebody, you know, 45 to, to 53 uh, and you say freestyle around here. Oh, yeah, man. Great. All right, go to uh, Des Moines, Iowa. Free what? <laughs> right, right, exactly. And well, and, they wouldn't even know the artist. And and of course, we've got the top two hundred markets across the U.S. and their weighted markets. You know, so so if a station in Tampa should play it, and and they play it twelve times, that's great. But if a New York station plays it once, it else it's it it, it, it bypasses the the twelve station the twelve times on Tampa. Right. You know, so so. If you and this is the sad part about this business, if you have a unless you can build it to the point of where you have a regional hit and you're really making a big splash in a region, 
even though you could hit, be hitting the major monitor charts, you're not getting any traction to where it's gaining anything to where it's going to make an impact. Back in the day, I don't know if you remember this, but sometimes artists would buy airtime on a radio station yeah, just to expose it. You know, right. it's a it, it, 60 second commercial. Check out the new song by Tony Mantor. Right. And play a piece of it, like, like 25, 30 seconds, and then a little clip available now for download, whatever, then play a li little bit more. The whole reason was it would be detected by media base and then right. it would count as a spin on the radio station. Exactly. You know, they got wise to that. They got wise to that. They did. They did. And, but you know, that thing, that thing is happening right now on TV. How do you where, mean? Well, you can, you can go on buy, buy a three to five minute spot to where they would treat it like they're interviewing you, but it's really a paid Advertise. absolutely and and that's for all different areas it could be yeah. you, you could be a doctor and do a show you know about doctors exactly. what's what's your advice somebody that is super talented has the drive could potentially be substantially big at some point what's your advice to that that person uh my my, my advice is make sure that whatever you do has the highest quality project that you can put out because if that product competes on a on not only on a national basis but worldwide, then you can play that song any place, and you won't be you won't be hearing a song by your favorite artist. Then your song dips down, and then another song comes in and it's back up to the level. Keep that quality level the same. Mm. Then once you do that, just go out there and perform. Uh, you know. Use your YouTube, use all the all the social media that you can use to build yourself and really trying to make an impact on a regional end. Because if you can make a, a, an impact on a regional area, because that's what the, they used to do. The major labels used to take and say, OK, let's let's we've got a guy from New England. Let's really focus on New England, get him going, New England. And right. then maybe we can take and branch it out and get him into the New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey area. And then you branch it out and you build. Well, now they try and take and make that big splash. They spend a hundred thousand, half a million, million, whatever they spend, and they put this on a national basis, really pumping, pumping the promotion and doing all this and and playing their little games that they do with the major major markets so they can get it played. And and you can't compete against that. So you've just still got to kind you've kind of kind of take a step back and say, okay, how do I compete? Try and do it regionally and try and build yourself. And still do the national stuff that you can do with the YouTube and the and the iTunes and all that stuff. And then hope you can create your own market and, and you can differentiate, differentiate yourself so that you're, you're doing the same thing, but you've separated yourself so you don't sound alike. And then you can build your own little, little thing and keep it going. And what, it goes back to what you said before. You are your own business. You are your own brand. Don't exactly. think that you're 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 attaching to you know Sony. <laughs> it's just that you know exactly. it's not realistic. Do you yeah. think you know that being somebody who's made music su successfully, work with artists successfully, that when we talk about the quality on a smaller scale, I mean, back in the day, you had to go into a big studio and record. Now you can do pretty darn good with just some basic stuff, you know, maybe above basic. Um, right. Can you get that quality? Do you feel, you know, that can be done or do you have to really go to a full, full all on out studio? Well, um, it depends upon the style of music. I mean, there, there was a while there that everybody thought when, when the, uh, when the internet started hitting and, and when, when these home little, little bedroom studios pop started popping up and everybody said, Oh, I can do this because I got Cubase or I got, I got, I, I got, uh, you know, whatever the, whatever they use, you know, um, uh, then what happened is, yeah, they had laid down tracks and they, they could, they could take and master it and they could do all the different things to it and it would sound good, but then after a while, they started realizing that they cannot get the true improv of bouncing an idea off from each other without having a band in the in the studio. So they kind of went away from it, and then they started yeah. coming back because because if if you don't have um, people in there that that can really work it and and lay it down. Okay. And then they bounce ideas off each other. You know, there's no, there's, you don't have any, you've got a single minded creation, but when you've got multiple people working on it, then you've got like four or five, six different people interjecting and then you're bouncing ideas. And then all of a sudden a mistake 
could turn into something that's just huge that's that that makes the difference and you wouldn't get that just doing it in your bedroom totally see that vision it's the collaboration yeah it's you know yeah. it, it, the little band i think they were called um the beatles did that yeah yeah <laughs> if yeah, i can remember band, correctly but, i don't know yeah. uh we just have a, a few minutes left. I know that you, um, and it's fascinating talking with you. I just keep going. <laughs> I love oh, yeah. it. Um, autism on your radar, and you're a big advocate for for helping in that regard. What are you working on? I um, I started a um, when the pandemic hit. I started a, um, a CD that I was going to do for myself, just for just for the enjoyment. Uh, give it to my friends, family, kids, grandkids. And then if some, you know, a hundred people wanted to buy it or whatever, I didn't, I didn't care, but I wasn't doing it for sales or, or for any, any accolades. I was just doing it for pure enjoyment. And I had a song sent, sent to me um, called why not me. And it was about positivity. It was about everything that I say on, on social media, never give up. It only doesn't matter when you do it. It only matters that you do it. And, and it started growing and I, I did a, um, so my promoters that I use in New York, Nashville, L.A., London, all told me, man, you got to release this song. There's nothing out there like it. It's very positive. And at that time, I had done it with a, a pop version. I added a steel for texture, kind of like the Eagles did. And everybody says, oh, you, you did a country song. And I'm going, no, but <laughs> if that's what you want to call it. So it wound up doing well in the in the secondary country charts. Uh, we did a video, and I and I actually did that video to pay tribute to our first responders, you know, because they were having tough times then. And I figured, well, you know, let's let's throw them a you know a pat on the back. And then after that, I thought that was done. That was it. And a lady called me up, and she is a uh, aut autistic teacher uh, for speech, speech therapy. So she had said, could you do something for us? And I gave her some thought, you know, talked with, you know, a few charities and everything. I decided, you know, why not? You know, so if I can help somebody, let's help someone. So uh, last fall, I I, I put out, uh, I re-recorded the song in a more adult contemporary sound. Um, I, I got local autistic people here in Nashville to join me in my video and I put it out and, and it's just kind of grown worldwide. I mean, wow. I mean, England, the UK, um, parts of Europe, Australia. I mean, everybody's reached out and they want to want to be part of it. So now I'm actually in the process of creating another video with the same song. We're going to re-record it, but this time it's going to be called Why Not Me the World? Because I've got people from Germany, Australia, uh, UK, uh, Switzerland, Sweden. I've got people all over the country because here in the US that want to be part of it. So I'm I'm starting to build this on a on a bigger platform and mm. um, just seeing where it goes. You know, just trying to help people. Love it, love it. Where where do we find that? Uh, they can they can go to YouTube and you know, Tony Mantra. Why not me, Nashville? Uh, they can go to TonyMantra.com. Uh, I've got everything that I've got uh, going on there, and I got to tell you. Um, I'm hoping that people hear this and they want to jump in and help because the biggest thing that I've got out of, out of this so far that is truly just, just really made me feel real good is, is I've had people, so many people reach out and want to tell me their stories, you know, so, so I've gotten people telling me stories mm -hmm. about their sons, their grandkids and everything. And it's just, it's just really, uh, it makes you step back and realize that, that, uh, you know, you and I, you know, being able to do what we're doing, you know, we're very fortunate. We get up, we don't have to worry about, about, uh, you know, what we're going to do the day. We don't have to, we, we've got our health, we've got everything in place, you know, and, and this kind of, kind of opens your eyes to, you know, there are people out there that need help on a daily basis and, and they need help to make transitions into the workforce, you know, so we need to take and not only feel good about what, where we are, but feel good that we can also help those that need help too. Well, you know what it's doing? It's creating a dialogue. What you did gets people talking about their situations and they feel more comfortable, like they're connected. And I love the, why not me, the world? If I remember correctly, I believe it was 1986 this week, we are the world was number one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so maybe there's some, there's a reason for being that we're even talking about, you know, a concept like that. You know, I hope so, you know, because, because the biggest thing that I've, that I've been, been telling in, in my, my interviews and everything is because this is April and, and this is autism awareness and acceptance month. Yeah. But the, the thing that I'm pushing is 
autism awareness, acceptance, and understanding, because you can be aware of something and you can accept that it's there, but until you understand what it's about and 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 what people have to deal with, you know, you don't, you kind of, you don't know what to say. You're worried about, oh, do I say the wrong thing? You have to maybe walk on eggshells so you don't, you don't, you know, insult anybody and or yeah. you know anything. If the more understanding we get, the more we can break those barriers down and and have conversations and hopefully, you know, make things a little better for everybody. Fantastic, uh, Tony. It was amazing talking with you. It really was. Uh, just you know, talking about the industry and everything else and and how the process works. And your website, Tony Mantor, M-A-N-T-O-R.com. Of course, we can look it up on YouTube as well if we want to see the, uh, the right. song. Uh, great talk today. And uh, and thank you. Yeah, I appreciate, appreciate it. it. I appreciate it. It was good. Appreciate you. Yeah, look forward to uh, getting together if we get a chance next time. Sounds great. Thank you so much. All we'll right. be right back. Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, Online Radio Box, and Simple Radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on MyTuner-Radio.com, or search Podcast Business News Network on Streama.com and OnlineRadioBox.com slash US. Take your podcasts on the go and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day -day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's... It's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house. And there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit HFOTUSA.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's. It's going to be okay.